welcome to Wasatch Weekends for this Saturday, November 11th edition. I'm your host, Ben Roof. On today's show, Bill Humbert is stopping by to give us a little bit of career advice. We've got a delicious crockpot recipe from Tracy Miller. Musician Samuel Harness also stops by to tell us a little bit about his recent television appearances. And then we've also got a delicious holiday craft that I'm gonna show you how to make for a gift this winter. But first, a quick local announcement. South Summit will be headed to the Southern Utah University's Eccles Coliseum today to take on San Juan in the 2A state championship. It's the first time South Summit has had the opportunity to win since their back-to-back -back titles in 2017 and 2018. So, the championship kicks off at 4 p.m. Best of luck to the Wildcats, but before we get started, let's take a look at the weather for today's game. This weather report is brought to you by Sun and Ski Sports, your new mountain sports headquarters. Welcome back to the show. As the seasons are changing, a lot of us can be looking for a change in our careers or in our lives. And joining us now is recruiter guy, Bill Humbert. Welcome to the show, Bill. Hey, Ben, thanks so much. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. And you've always got such great advice for people looking for a change in their career or people who are looking to bring in some new life into their business. So tell us a little bit about what makes the fall and this time of year such a great time to begin a career search or to look for something new? Well, you know, Ben, I've found over the years that November and December are the best months to get out there and start doing your career search. And how do I know that? When I coach professionals in their career searches, I suggest that they double down on their networking now. And the reasons are many. So tell me a little bit about some of those reasons. Like why is now a good time to double down on your networking and to really reach out? I mean, I know holiday parties and stuff are definitely part of the deal this year. Is that the reason? Well, that's one of the many reasons, Ben. Uh, first of all, most by now the budgets are done. And so most managers know what positions they can fill in January. And it's always good to ask the managers that question. So what positions, as you're talking to them, what positions can you open in January? And if you're a fit for one of those positions, how just say, hey, how about interviewing me now? And if it seems like a match, you can extend an offer now with a start in early January, and that way you're done recruiting. Awesome. And some managers will go, ah, brilliant. So with those budgets finished, that gives a lot of those businesses a lot of time to kind of see what they have room for and where their growth positions are. And now would be kind of a great time to kind of sneak in there a little bit early, right? Exactly. And, and so by doing it now, all your, most of your competitions, the, the ones that aren't listening to me, they are sleeping. They're going, well, I'll start my, my job search after the holidays. So if you can sneak in now and get a great interview and find a position you really like and get the offer and accept the offer, you can relax over the holidays because you've got it nailed down. Well, and 
as we do approach the holidays, it definitely is kind of a lull in the business world. And I can definitely see a lot of people who are thinking about changing positions, looking for something new, kind of envisioning that change of the year, that start of the year, a New Year's resolution even, to begin that process. Because it can be something that can be challenging and really kind of something that a lot of people can build up hesitation towards, making a big life change like that. Are there any actions that you would advise to kind of help you get that job search started off on the right foot? Well, here's something that's important to remember. Only 8% of all jobs are posting and hoping the right person is looking at your resume. And guess what? I'm a recruiter. They're not. What's happening is the ap applicant tracking systems are going through and doing keyword matches. They call it artificial intelligence. I call it artificial, artificial intelligence. And what they're doing is they're screening you out. So the best way to get in there is to start networking. And this is the best time because everybody's feeling warm and fuzzy. And so now they'll answer your calls. If you're in their um, contacts list, chances are they're going to pick up the phone and have a conversation with you. So as we're starting to build that networking, as opposed to really going out and looking for the jobs online, as I know I've told you before, I have never once been successful looking for a job online. It's for me, it's always been my personal network and my friends and family and friends of friends or friends of family that have been able to help me find that job that I've been looking for and get that leg up in my career. So how do you recommend beginning that networking process during the holidays? Would holiday cards be a great way to start? I'm, I'm a person who likes to be more active. Um, we have, there's this device that's really cool. You can get the weather on it, you can get traffic on it, and you can even make phone calls with it. It's amazing. And making that direct connection, that phone call is going to be much more effective for everybody, including you, if you talk to people. Because humans like to talk to other humans. And I personally have never had a bad experience of reaching out to somebody over the phone. I mean, even if it's just a you know, unfortunately, we're not hiring right now. It at least gets that conversation started and they hear your voice, you hear theirs, and the introduction is at least made. Exactly. That's, you know, 74 to 76% of all the positions are filled through networking. And that's a metric that was created over the last 45 years by the career transition industry. And that's the industry that helps people who, groups of people who were laid off from a position find their next job. So 74 to 76% of all jobs are filled through networking. That's the way I'd go. So I know for some people, it can definitely be a bit of a challenge making that first contact and reaching out that first time, whether they don't know anybody at the company and they're just interested in beginning that networking process and trying to open a couple of those doors. How do you recommend starting that process? Do you look for a phone number for the company to call or do you start like pursuing LinkedIn and trying to figure out who in that company is the person you want to talk to? Well, obviously, we have a tool today that we didn't have in 1981 when I started recruiting. In 1981, I had to call 44 people and have conversations with 44 people every single day when I began my recruiting business or my recruiting work. And sometimes I had phone numbers I could go after people. Other times I just looked the phone numbers up and there was no Internet to get them. <laughs> And so today there's an internet. It's amazing. And, and so use that and use LinkedIn. Just if you search on the name of the company, click on that and then go down. Many times it'll show you a list of employees that work there. If you link with one or two of those employees, many times they're linked with other employees. And then that's how you can mine that area. Just 
look, people, most people miss that one column um, that says people also viewed and many times they're members of the company and so you link with them and then you now you've got contact information and a name of a person who may be managing that area give them a call what if you're starting out just from the company's website and it's an i've noticed anyway that a lot of websites can be fairly opaque with the contact information it either tries to reroute you to a chat service or if there is a phone number, it's an automated phone system that ends up taking you in circles. Do you have any advice for how to kind of get past that automated customer service side of the business and try and get to a real person who's actually making decisions? Well, today I would use AI. You know, get on AI on ChatGPT and put the, what is the contact phone number for ABC company? And you, you'll probably get that customer service one, or if they don't have one, and by the way, I refuse to work with tech, technology companies that don't have a phone number. I mean, there's obviously some out there that I much don't have any choice, and that's LinkedIn, but, uh, I, but I won't work with companies that don't give me an opportunity to talk to people. Uh, but AI will give you a phone number and you can just do a Google search or a Bing search and be able to get a contact phone number. What are some other ways that you would recommend somebody starting out that job search and trying to begin their networking? How else could they take advantage of some of these AI tools to kind of help bolster their experience? Well, for most people, Ben, the best thing to do is go to your own contacts, tell them what it is you're looking for, tell them a little bit about your recent experience, especially any big accomplishments that you've had, why it is you want to leave now. It could be, I'm topped out. I just need to find another company where I can grow. And then end with what I would like to do next is, and then ask, who do you feel I should speak with next? And you could say, who do you feel that I should speak with next at Vail, for instance? And, and a lot of times they know people at, at Vail or any other company, and they'll say, well, you know, I have a friend, a golfing buddy that you need to talk to, or I have a, a trainer that I know over there, and, and that gets you in that door and just beginning that process of that six degrees of separation and trying to leapfrog your way from one relationship to the next until you get to that right person. Exactly, exactly. And that's how it works, and it works great that way. I've been, I've been networking since 1981. Well, and actually everybody else has been networking since they were a child. They tell me, I've never networked before. And I said, when you were three years old and somebody walked past you with an ice cream cone, what'd you say? Where'd you get that? <laughs> That's networking. Well, awesome, Bill. Is there anything else you want to tell us before we let you go? Uh, just one real quick thing. Expect success. The science of the over 50 career search is doing really well. And it's the ultimate job search guide because I'm a recruiter. I know what's going on behind the curtains. So you can get that on literally anywhere. Amazon's a good start. Well, so, you know, this is an opportunity to accelerate your job search. Bill Humbert, author of Expect Success, the Over 50 Career Search Recruiter Guy. Bill Humbert, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ben. It was great to be here. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too. And we'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Wasatch Weekends. As we're starting to move into the winter, one of my favorite things to do is to have a warm meal ready for me when I get home. And Tracy Miller is gonna show us a delicious crock pot meal that we can set up before we get out on the slopes or get off to work and then have it ready for when we get home. Let's take a look. It's chilly this morning. What's up? It's summertime here in the mountains, but the fruit and vegetables are so delicious. So today, what we're doing is the tri-tip. It was a big like five pound tri-tip of steak. 
So we did that in the crock pot, but we're also gonna do a corn and zucchini salad because this is the time that both corn and zucchini are plentiful and delicious. So I've already shucked my corn, and what I'm gonna do is just put it in boiling water for about five minutes, maybe even a little bit less, because what happens when your veggies are super fresh like this, they do not take nearly as long to cook. So we're gonna do a cold corn salad. So we just have this corn in boiling water, and we're just gonna kind of rotate it around and let it cook for about five minutes. Meanwhile, we are going to make our, our salad, and this is gonna be super easy. Zucchini, you can cook the zucchini if you want, just cut the, cut the tips off. And um, we have talked about different methods of chopping. So today, what we're gonna do is we are going to dice this up. So we're gonna cut the zucchini into about four pieces. And I hope you remember by now, when you're doing working with these veggies, Look at that, you don't want that, you want it to be a nice flat surface. So what you do is you cut the zucchini in half and then cut it into four pieces. And then we are gonna cut it into three pieces this way and then we're gonna just dice it really, really small. And this is gonna be served raw, so you kinda of wanna dice it nice and small, maybe about the size of a corn cob because we are going to be taking the corn right off of the, right off of the cob. So you wanna dice it kinda of the size of a corn kernel. And then we're gonna do the same with this one. And I've decided only to cook two corns today because we don't wanna waste it here, but if you have a family of four, you're doing four pieces of corn and you're also doing the whole zucchini. I'm just gonna do half the zucchini today because we're doing a half a recipe right now. We're also gonna add some fresh green onion to it. Of course, if you prefer the red onion, and a lot of people do, then go ahead and put a red onion in here. Just slice it really, really thin so that you don't get too strong of an onion bite in your salad. So here we go, just chopping that up. Don't forget your sharp knife and your nice, you know, very stable cutting board because you don't want everything to be sliding all around. And again, everything is so fresh in the summertime that it really just needs only a little bit of cooking. And a lot of people like to eat raw. And when you are eating raw, you know, your stomach has to get prepared for it, but it's really healthy for you because the more that you cook your vegetables, you know, if you're overcooking them or something like that, the more nutrients they lose. So what happens is right when you cut up your veggies, they start to lose their minerals and their vitamins. So fresh is great and cutting up everything right before you're about to eat it is the way to go as well. Okay, when I'm checking my corn, I just kind of take a little, I want this to still have that pop, you know, that really crisp pop. So I just kind of take my knife and see that it pops and it pops a little bit. I'm gonna let this cook for just a couple and probably another minute or so, but really when you have this super fresh corn, you can cook it for really like three, four, five minutes, depending on how big the kernels are. My kernels are kind of big right now, but some of them that you're gonna get, they'll be little tiny. I actually was uh, writing an article about corn a couple years ago and a farmer wrote me back or emailed me, I, I don't remember the, the mode of uh, communication, and said, you know, Tracy, I loved your article because I told people don't overcook your corn. Like everybody cooks their corn forever and you really don't need to. You can cook it really, really quickly and it tastes much better. And he said, I'm glad you wrote that article because everybody overcooks their corn, you know, then it gets stuck in your teeth and it's all mushy. And he said, I sometimes when I'm out at the farm, I check the corn and he just pulls the husk off and eats it right there raw, right off of the right off of where it's growing. So just know that it's true. You don't have to cook your corn that long. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put this hot corn into a bath of cold water. It's called blanching and you do it with your veggies if you wanna cool them off very quickly and if you want them to uh, maintain their beautiful color. So a lot of times when you are like putting veggies on a veggie platter, you have broccoli or something like that and you want it to be nice and, and green, you'll blanch it. You put it in boiling water, you boil it, and then you put it in ice cold water and that's called blanching and it's a great way just to maintain the color of your of your veggies and kind of keep them looking really pretty. And this is gonna be a cold salad, so if you're heading out on a picnic or something like that, then you can take this with you. Now we're gonna make a super easy salad dressing and I'm gonna do it right in the bowl. Let's see here. 
Our salad dressing is going to be a creamy one because we have, you know, we have a, a kind of a fatty cut of meat. So we're going to cut it a little bit with a cream. And whenever I make salad dressings that are creamy based, I do a mixture of mayonnaise and sour cream. If you just do mayonnaise, you kind of get a really a strong mayonnaise flavor. But if you mix some of that sour cream in there, equal parts, it's what we call cutting the flavor of the mayonnaise. So I'm just going to do equal parts, about a tablespoon of each. You're going to do two tablespoons because you're doubling, doubling up your recipe. So I have a tablespoon of mayonnaise and then a tablespoon of sour cream. And really, I can put sour cream on anything. It's one of my favorites. So we have those, and we're also gonna add a little bit of olive oil as well, just about a half a tablespoon of olive oil, because we just want a little more juice to it. And of course, salt and pepper. We'll add that. And then we want something acidic. So we're gonna add some fresh lime juice to that. And whenever you're making a, uh, a salad dressing, you typically want something nice and acidic in there because that's going to, once again, cut the, the harsh flavors of the creamy dressing that we have. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna squeeze the whole entire lime. And this is actually a good juicy lime. I broke my, my lime juicer, I think I overused it, but if you have one of those tools, those are the best. And another hint is if you put the lime or the lemon in the microwave, that gives you so much juice. Sometimes when I'm grilling, if I'm grilling fish and I wanna put lemon on the side or something like that, I'll just cut the lemon in half and put it on the grill and you squeeze it in a second and it has so much juice. Okay, so there we have our kind of our creamy dressing. And this is gonna be just nice and fresh. Stir that around so it gets all combined. Give it a little taste too, because don't forget when you're working with fresh veggies and fresh fruits like lime, you might be like, oh my gosh, that lime is so sour. I need to add a little bit of sweetness like honey or a little tiny bit of sugar or something like that. So give it a taste. See if you need to add anything. I'm gonna taste it on the zucchini actually. So I'm gonna give it a little taste. Mm. Mm, I think it tastes pretty good. It tastes a lot like uh, olive oil, so. I might wanna put a little more lime juice if I can squeeze a little more in there. And again, when you're working with fresh fruits and vegetables, you always have to taste them. And I'm gonna put a tad bit more sour cream in there just to kind of lighten it up a little because that olive oil is strong. When you're working with olive oil, of course it's super healthy for you, but it's also pretty strong in flavor. So if you're looking, if you don't like the taste of olive oil and you want something different, then use a vegetable oil or a grapeseed oil or something that has a lighter flavor, a sunflower oil or something like that. All right, now I'm just gonna put my zucchini and my onions right in there. And of course, sometimes the taste mellow after you put your fruits and veggies into the salad, into the salad dressing. Sometimes I'll taste something all by itself and I'll be like, oh, puckered up, that's like way too strong or something like that. But actually when you get to eating it, it's not at all because it combines nicely with the flavors. This weather report is brought to you by Sun and Ski Sports, your new mountain sports headquarters. to the show. Now with this next guest, I always love when they're here joining us. We've got Nuzzles and Company and a furry friend. How are you, Josh? I'm doing great. How are you? So good. Now, who do you have with you today? Uh, her name is Flint, F-L-Y-N-T, and she's named after, uh, her whole litter is named after characters from Tarzan. Uh, she comes from the Navajo Reservation. She's super cute, and you can see the She's got a lot of spots. Uh, the whole the whole litter actually has a lot of really unique kind of coloring and spots on their faces and their bodies. So probably a lot of cattle dog in the in the bloodline. And 
I definitely have experienced their hurting tendencies already when I'm around them. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's just got stunning, pretty eyes. Look at how light they are. What a cute Yeah, very, puppy. very beautiful. Uh, a lot of baby blue eyes in the bunch. And uh, they're, they're just, they're so colorful and beautiful and, and uh, just totally in that puppy play mode. They're probably about nine weeks old is what we're thinking. They've been uh, at a ranch for a couple of weeks, one of our vet techs ranches for foster. So they've been around other animals and just living the lovely ranch life. And uh, they're a lot of fun. The ranch life for the dogs are probably the best life, but I'm sure they're excited to go to a loving and warm home. So holidays are coming up. You probably see a lot of adoptions happening around this time of year. Um, what advice do you have? What should we be looking out for as we consider adopting a puppy as a gift? It's a great question and you're right. A lot of people do consider bringing an animal into their life uh, as a Christmas experience or holiday experience. Uh, I think it's just be honest when you're when you're looking and you're reaching out. Um, if you come to Nuzzles, just say like, hey, I'm, I'm looking for an animal that's going to fit in a family of four and I've got younger children. And we can talk about whether a puppy's a good fit. Uh, we'll ask some good questions like how often are you home? A, a puppy needs somebody who's going to be every two to three hours to let them out to the bathroom, four hours max. Um, so if you work from home, that's a great situation. If you have a parent who stays at home, that's great. But if you have two full-time uh, professionals who are gone 12 hours a day, then a puppy might not be a good fit for you. Absolutely. And you probably see a lot of, oh, well, we want to adopt a dog, so it's super cute when you open the presents on Christmas. But how often do you see animals come back to the shelter? Do you really screen ahead of time to try and avoid those situations? I mean, we, we ask a lot of questions. Um, when we do the adoption application, there really is more of a conversation happening about making sure it's a good fit um whether the the breed is right for you um with the best of knowledge that we have about the animals but we spend a lot of time with them and kind of get to know their tendencies and uh and sort of the meander there, put me back on track. Oh, just being able to make sure that you're really homing the animals with the right families and, and what it looks like after the holidays. Do people bring the pup puppies back? You know, are you seeing an uptick in that or do you really do an intense screening so that these puppies are in their forever homes? I would say it's kind of a medium version of a screening, but we do offer also a foster to adopt situation. So it's almost like a trial. So let's bring the puppy home, make sure it's a good fit with your family. And those situations we look at it as, yeah, like give it give it three days or, or so and let's see how that works. And we don't feel bad if an animal comes back for that. If somebody does a full on adoption and then they're like a week later, they're like, you know, this isn't really working. It stings us a little bit more, but at the same time, we want the animal to be a good fit for people. So if it isn't working, then bring them back to us. And, and we have that in all our contracts. Like if, if your life changes for any reason and you can't take care of it, bring, bring a nuzzle animal back to nuzzles. Wonderful. And, you know, that's an important conversation to be having as we head into the holiday season. Now, oh my goodness, I am obsessed with Flynn. I cannot wait to just pet her. She seems like such a sweet little puppy there. Now, tell Super me. Super soft, what, too. What is that? She's really soft. And she's got brothers and sisters as well, I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, litter of seven, actually. I didn't say that. <laughs> awesome. So you have some exciting things happening as well when it comes to regard for animal health. And tell me a little bit more about what you've got going on. Um, you mentioned there's a, a, a quite an impressive goal that you have in store. So um, this lovely little lady and her siblings come from the Navajo Reservation, a little place called Cayenta. And we have a little facility down there. And currently our vet team and several members of our staff are down there with the goal of doing 300 spay-neuter operations in three days. So they're really there for five days, you know, a day to drive down, get set up, three days of surgery and a day to pack up and, and head back home. So kind of a whirlwind of a trip. And I'm sure the way that we have it set up, the, the surgeons will just be standing in one spot and everybody else will do all the prep work, bring the animal to them. They'll do the quick surgery move the animal to recovery set situation and then the surgeon is back on to the next animal and that's the way you get through 300 animals in three days 300 animals in three days it is definitely important work to try and preserve the life of, of the animal as well so um, impressive work that you are doing over there now josh where can we go for more information if we want to find out about fostering to adopt about volunteer opportunities 
I mean, to see the animals that we have available for adoption, to figure out how to get involved in whatever way works best for you, whether it's volunteering, fostering, adoption, or even just being a donor. Uh, Nuzzlesandco.org is our website, and there's just loads and loads of information there for you. Oh, I'm sure as soon as Flint hits the air, <laughs> she's not going to be available for long. What a gorgeous puppy you've got there. Josh, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on and um, best of luck as you head into the holiday season. Awesome. Thanks so much and thanks for having me. Now stay tuned. We'll be right back after this with more content for you. Welcome back to Wasatch Weekends. We're gonna get back to Tracy Miller in the kitchen and she's gonna finish up that delicious crock pot recipe. All right, here's a fun thing to do. <laughs> we are going to take the corn off the cob. Now this is, this is always nice to have a flat surface for this too. Ooh, yeah, that corn is looking really good and very fresh. We're just gonna do this. Some people say they like to put their corn like in a bunt cake container where you can like stick the corn cob in there and then the corn just falls into the bunt cake. Um, that's high maintenance for me, but if you're a newbie at getting the corn off the cob, that might be something you'd like to do. But this is pretty easy actually. And if you've ever had a kid or yourself with braces, you've done this before. All right, look at how nice and easy that comes off. Sharp knives are a key in the kitchen, which of course you should know that by now. Blanching is always really nice to do when you're working with fresh fr fruits and vegetables if you want to cook them and then keep them cold after. All righty, so now we have our corn. I'm just going to put that right there and break it up a little. Zucchini and corn salad. And I'm actually gonna add Aroma Tomato to this as well so I can give it a nice shot of color. And tomatoes, all this stuff is just super delicious and fresh right now. So the Romas are actually really good. Romas are nice because they're kind of hardy and they, they can last, you know, you can find them throughout the year. Oh, now I have corn all over me. The corn does go flying. <laughs> okay, so, so we're gonna cut the Roma again, just like we cut it. We cut the zucchini. I'm gonna give it some stripes with a nice sharp knife. And then I'm going to make it really small. So they're all kind of the same size. A serrated knife is really nice to use if you're cutting tomatoes as well. If your knife isn't super duper sharp, it kind of makes it a little bit easier. If the kids are helping you or something, you wanna give them a serrated knife. Make it a little less dangerous for them. Okay, so. We have a super simple fresh salad. Keep it simple in the summertime because fruits and veggies are so good, you don't wanna muck them up with too much stuff. So here we go, a nice creamy salad right there. Give it a taste, see if it needs a little more salt and pepper. Add some lettuce if you'd like to. And there we have it. I'm gonna give it another shot of salt and pepper. And that's about it. Then you just like let it cool down. It'll be nice and tasty and colorful. And it has that creamy texture, which I think you're gonna like with the beef tri-tip. Okay, let's move over to here where we have our crock pot. I have my crock pot going and I actually cook this overnight, which is kind of what I like to do. Now I'm gonna show you the end result of that five pound beef tri-tip. Look at this. It's all nice and cooked and it's really juicy. Do you see how much juice is in there? All I did was I put the tri-tip, I cut it in half and I put it right in the crock pot. I didn't add any water, I didn't add any broth. And I think that one of the big mistakes that people make when they're cooking with their crock pot is they always wanna add a little liquid. So if you have a fatty piece of meat, like this or maybe a pork that has some fat on it or really even chicken, I don't add any liquid to my crock pot because what happens is your crock pot is a slow cooker. If you don't have a crock pot, you can put your tri-tip in a pan, in a baking pan, and then cover it with a piece of saran wrap and then a piece of aluminum foil 
tighten it all the way around and cook it in your oven at about 285 for mm, eight to 10 hours. And that's what I did on this one. I did it on slow for 10 hours. I did it overnight and then it was ready and it was cooked to perfection. And it's juicy enough that I don't need to add any more juices. So what happens, one of the big problems that people do with their crock pots is they put a meat in there and then they put a whole bunch of broth in there. So what happens is you're kind of just boiling your meat. You're not gonna get any kind of sear. You're not gonna get that slow cook. You're just gonna get boiled meat. So be very careful when you're adding liquid to your crock pot. I really think it's completely unnecessary. And when I do chicken in here too, even if I do a chicken breast, I'll usually put a couple onions or carrots at the bottom and then I'll put the chicken breast on top that's seasoned and then I'll just close it down and cook it for like four hours or something. And it gets juicy enough because the natural juices from the chicken and from the veggies are gonna start to secrete and that's gonna give it a lot of flavor and that's gonna make it so that there's enough liquid on the bottom that you're not gonna wake up to like a burnt crock pot, but you're gonna have some great flavor. So let's see what this looks like. We'll move the salad over here. I cut this in half just to fit into my crock pot. It was well seasoned already, so we kind of got like a little easy one on this with this, with this beef tri-tip. Okay, and here we go. Definitely a little oily, which is why I wanted to do like a creamy sauce. And now let's see. I'm just gonna slice it. And it's gonna shred. It's gonna shred a little too, so you could shred the whole thing if you wanted to with two forks. But there you go. So you have some nice meat right there. Look at how nice that is and look at how tender it's cooked. So that can last a while. And there's a lot of recipes you could do with this. You know, you can make some tacos out of it if you wanted to. You could just put it on your, cold, on your cold salad if you wanted to. Lots of different recipes. I'm gonna say it's more of a high fat meat, so you're gonna want something pretty healthy on the side, but you know, that's just what I say. So let's plate this up and make it look really nice. Let me get this out of the way. Here's our plate. Let's get a little bit of meat here. And then some salad. More salad than meat, right? Everybody knows that you're supposed to have like three fourths of your plate or actually half of your plate filled up with veggies, a quarter of it with a meat, and then a quarter of it with a starch if you're doing that. But here we go. We have the tri-tip and it's gonna be served with this creamy salad, a corn salad. So you have a lot of fresh veggies and then you have a little meat. So if you're looking to do a little barbecue, this is gonna be perfect. And using the crock pot in the summertime is really nice because you get your meat but yet you don't have to heat up your whole entire kitchen. So I really encourage people to use a crock pot in the summertime just for that reason, because nobody wants to turn on the oven in the summer and the crock pot just sits there. It warms up just its little spot and it doesn't get your whole house warm. So that's the beef tri-tip with the corn and zucchini salad. Once again, thank you for paying attention. I hope you really enjoy it. And let me know if you have any questions. And if you do, you can email me at tracy at colorfulcooking.com. This weather report is brought to you by Sun and Ski Sports, your new mountain sports headquarters. kitchen segments because that means we are approaching the holiday season and approaching the holiday season. There's lots of fun things to do. So Ben, you are going to show me something really fun to make to yeah. give away so gifts. 
One of the things that we've always done in my family in the holiday tradition is we've made a bunch of different homemade gifts. And one of the like all-time favorites is hot chocolate kits. <laughs> I love so, a good cup of hot chocolate. I mean, everybody loves hot chocolate in the summer, and as ski season's coming on, you know, we're getting to warm up. And so these kits are great. They look like little ice cream cones, and they are servings for four. And so there's everything you would need for four hot chocolates in there, toppings, everything. Awesome. Well, in honor of today's segment, I actually had a cup of hot chocolate last night right before awesome. I went to bed. So I cannot wait to see how we make these fun and delicious kits. I drank way too much hot chocolate last night, making sure I had <laughs> everything ready and was prepared for everything to go. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And we're going to make our own Swiss mess. Awesome. I love that. You know, so, what's great about these two, you know, we are entering into the holiday season. You can use it as a gift, but you can throw it in a backpack and take it out on the mountain. So I think it's all purpose. Opening and day tomorrow, you want something warm and delicious and festive. Here if we we're really feeling ambitious and we want to make a huge batch, the batch would be good for up to a year just stored in a cool, dry place. So it's not something that we need to like rush out to make use of right now. Awesome. So let's get started. All right. Got this guy here. We got a mixing bowl, of course, and got to have a whisk. <laughs> Far and away, my favorite kitchen thing is whisk. I just <laughs> love saying the word whisk. <laughs> so we're gonna start out here. We've got our two and a half cups of condensed milk. Okay. Or not condensed milk, powdered milk. Powdered condensed milk. milk would be a little bit wetter than this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Pour that guy in there. So that's two and a half cups. Yep, two and a half cups of just normal powdered milk. And you can just get that at any grocery store. Great value, this particular one, Walmart. <laughs> And that's one of the other great things about this. It's a nice impact for the gift. It's, you know, really visually stunning. It's something that people are gonna enjoy, are gonna be able to use, and it's really, really cheap to make. Awesome. So well, we like that. We like cost cost friendly gifts. <laughs> exactly. After we've got our powdered milk in there, then we're after our baking cocoa. Okay. So again, it's just standard baking chocolate, just like you would find at any grocery store. Pretty easy to be, you know. Fortunately, it's not very sweet. You so. don't have to have like a specific brand. You can just get any nope, kind. Any kind. I mean, okay. I personally prefer like heavier cocoa contents. So mm -hmm. I went with a 70% here. Or actually, no, I think this one's 100%. Huh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to dump that guy right in there too. Okay, so we've got our powdered milk, yep. our baking cocoa. Awesome. And our baking cocoa, we're only using a cup of baking cocoa. Okay. So it's going to be two and a half cups of milk, one cup of cocoa, and then we've got two cups here of powdered sugar or confectioner sugar, as opposed to like your granulated sugar, which you've got here. The reason we're using powdered sugar mm -hmm. is it mixes in a lot better and creates a little bit more of a smoother consistency. And so we'll just go in there, try not to turn everything into a giant powdery smoke screen. <laughs> so you're just kind of layering everything in. Exactly, layering everything in and then the whisking it all together. <laughs> and before for, we're not quite done yet, so I'm just going to whisk our ingredients here together, make sure that we've got it all nice and mixed, and it's already starting to get a little bit of that nice chocolatey texture. It looks no. delicious. <laughs> exactly, right? It smells great. But now, we've got a couple more things to add before we're really done here, and our next big thing, and this is kind of our secret ingredient here, is... Cornstarch. Cornstarch. Okay. Why? We're going to add a little bit of cornstarch, oh. and what that's going to do is that's going to help it thicken up when okay. we mix the water in mm -hmm. if we're using water, because we're designing this to use water. You can still use warm milk. You can still use whatever, you know, oat milk, almond milk, whatever drink you prefer, because mm -hmm. that little bit of, you know, can, or that little bit of powdered milk here, it's not going to be dairy-free with the powdered milk, mm -hmm. but that's going to allow you to use whatever liquid you prefer. But that cornstarch is going to help it be a little bit thicker and help it give that, you know, nice hot chocolate consistency that we're all so used to. Mm -hmm. And so we got our cornstarch here. Using the water, too, makes it easy when you're on the go if you don't exactly. have your preferred milk on hand. Exactly. Yeah. And so then our cornstarch here, we're using two teaspoons of cornstarch. And then we're also going to add just a little pinch of salt here, and that's going to give just that little bit of offset for the chocolate. I, I do like a sweet and salty flavor combination, so now, I think that's going to be delicious. And this is kind of our basic recipe here. If we really wanted to pump it up a notch, which we don't really have time for today, okay. but what we would do is we would take our powdered milk mm -hmm. and lay it out in a baking sheet and bake it for about 15 minutes. 
So it gets like a nice golden brown color. And that's going to give our hot chocolate a little bit of an extra carameliness to it. Interesting. A little bit of an extra depth to the flavor. And then... How did you learn the trick of dish. baking it? That was an Alton Brown thing <laughs> okay. that I picked up watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully he, somebody picks up and watches our show and will be making this hot and chocolate. <laughs> his other thing that he recommended was adding a dash of cayenne pepper. Yep. Um, so I we'll do to, that I here. I have to interrupt there. Oh, I yeah, go love... For it cayenne pepper in mixed with chocolate it is delicious. One of my favorite ice cream shops when I used to live in Nashville had a chocolate ice cream with a lot of cayenne pepper in it. So the fact that this is the warm version, I'm so excited. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah, we're just gonna whisk all that in there real quick. And then our hot chocolate mix. You see all the, all the, uh, the residue coming up from the bowl. Right? I cannot wait to try it. <laughs> and that's it, our hot chocolate mix is done. Easy, yep. perfect. Pretty short, pretty simple. And okay, so, so the main ingredients are? Main ingredients are two and a half cups of powdered milk, two cups of confectioner sugar, one cup of cocoa, and then two teaspoons of cornstarch, corn starch, and then a pinch of salt and a pinch of cayenne pepper. Perfect layering of flavors, Boom. in my opinion. But now, <laughs> for what makes it special and makes it our big trick is we are gonna use some clear piping bags. Okay. And we're gonna take, whoop, a cup of our mixture here, and we're just gonna fill our piping bag with it. But first, we've gotta put something down in the bottom here to kind of create a little bit of a tip for us. Okay. So, what do you think? Should we go with sprinkles? <laughs> or This is hard chips? to decide. I, I, I love anything with sprinkles in it. So yeah, let's All go right, with sprinkles. Go sprinkles. Yeah. You can never have too many sprinkles in my opinion. Exactly, okay. and I mean, in the one that we've got there, I found the hot chocolate, you know, using the chocolate chips, it kind of got mixed in a little bit at the bottom there. <laughs> so easily the trickiest part, if you ask me, is just getting everything in here nice and layered. And not way overdoing it. <laughs> but this is, this is up to your discretion, so you can put it as little or as much as you want. Exactly, I mean, mm -hmm. Really, you kind of want to envision four cups of hot chocolate with okay. everything that you've got because we're only going to have enough room in our um, piping bag here for about a cup of hot cocoa. Okay. Or a cup of hot cocoa mix. Okay. And so it's a quarter cup of the mix to one mug of cocoa. So okay. these make about four mugs. All right. So we're running out of time here, but let's go fill this up real fast and make our little... It's gonna be fun watching you put this in there. Oh. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it myself because oh, you're gonna hold to, that open hold for it. me. Okay, I'm here for that. Awesome. All right. I'm just gonna give it nice and stiff. Oh no! And it's a party. And it is a party on this Thursday morning on Good Morning Vale. Doing holiday. our best not to make a giant mess. <laughs> a holiday party, and look at that, gorgeous. We did it. <laughs> Somewhat. Almost. <laughs> But now to finish it off, to really create that like ice cream cone look, we're gonna create a layer of... Chocolate chips. Chocolate chips right there. And this Boom. is the fun part. You can really put whatever toppings that you like to put into your Exactly, and if we had a funnel, we could be a little bit cleaner up here in the top, or if we had a rag, we could just wipe that out real fast and keep everything nice and clean. But then to top it off, we've got to give it some marshmallows to really make it look and then like to, to that. And make it very holiday and festive if we were to tie it off on the top. You just use whatever ribbon you want to. And we've got some exactly. pretty ribbon here. I'm just gonna go ahead and cut a couple pieces. And then we just turn the top there. I'll let you do that. I'll do the tying. All right. Tie it off. And I'm a big fan of you know, the, uh, the curly Q ribbon. So I'm an expert, I'd like to say. All right. I'm the one that gets designated to do that whenever we're wrapping gifts in my Gotta in my see household. the professional curly Q ribbons. All right, well, we'll see how, I've never done it on a hot chocolate cone, so we'll see how that goes. You wanna hold it? I will hold it. Yeah. Awesome. So I think the fun part with, did you know the, the trick and the secret to this? You go the opposite side of the natural curl and you just pull it up like that. Boom, okay. magic. You do this side, boom, and you just kind of, and then if you really want to set it off for your holiday gift, you know, wrapping it up with a card or a little bit of like oh. 
some sort of notice, you know, and then also include a little like printout with the ingredients or something, or mm -hmm. just, you know, the instructions, not the ingredients, but cup of cocoa, or one mug per quarter cup of mix, and there'll be four in each cone. All right, well, I know what I'm gonna be doing in this commercial break, making up a nice cup of hot cocoa. I cannot oh, wait to Oh, we definitely it. have plenty of mixed up <laughs> over. We've got the cayenne pepper. I love the secret ingredient, a little bit of salt. It's just uh, quite delightful. So I'm excited to try it. Thanks for sharing today. Oh, well, thank you. I, it was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I love learning people's holiday family recipes. So this is just a really good one to, to and implement. My family has a bunch. So we'll be back. Awesome. Sure. Well, stay tuned. I'm going to go make that cup of hot cocoa and then we'll be back with sports, crock pots and more. So stay tuned. Hour one is on our way. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this Saturday edition of Wasatch Weekends. And don't forget, make yourself some hot chocolates and give it a try because it's a fantastic holiday gift. Until next time, I'm Ben. This is Wasatch Weekends and we will see you tomorrow.